So where was Jesus between Good Friday and Easter? This question comes up for Christians who want to make a difference as ministers, because people ask and wonder, so did Jesus die on the cross? And some people have heard of the Apostles' Creed's words, and he died and was buried and he descended into hell. So Jesus died on the cross and then he descended into hell. And why does that matter? And many people wonder, is it important to know where Jesus was between Good Friday and Easter? So today we're going to look at where was Jesus between Good Friday and Easter and why does that matter? Well, we read that on Good Friday, he was crucified. Mark 15, verse 25 to 27 says, It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him, the king of the Jews, they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right hand and the other on his left. We know that Jesus was here on this earth around 30 AD. He had a ministry with his disciples. He preached the kingdom of God. He lived a sinless life, connected to his Father in heaven. He taught his disciples how to love one another. He, an innocent, Savior was crucified with two robbers. So what did he do on the cross? As Christians, we believe that he paid the debt of sin. We believe he was the sacrificial lamb. We believe that he brought forgiveness for you and me. Through the death of Jesus, we are now children of God. Ephesians 2 verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. So, where was Jesus between Good Friday and Easter? Did Jesus descend into hell? The Apostles' Creed in many English versions states, He descended into hell. So the question is, what is hell? In the Old English, hell could refer to the final place of judgment or the grave. So let's look at the final place of judgment option first, hell as Gehenna. And in the New Testament, we see one example of the use of the word hell as Gehenna, the Greek word Gehenna. Matthew 10, verse 28, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. And that Greek word there is Gehenna. So in the New Testament, there's two words that have been translated as referring to hell. One word is the word Gehenna. And that's the word that refers to the final place of judgment. That's where concern yourself with that which will throw you into Gehenna, hell. So did Jesus descend to that place, to hell? The other option is the Sheol option. And this option, to explain it, I'll, I'm going to read the story of the rich man in Lazarus. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. Now Jesus tells us this story. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even dogs came 
and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angel carried him to Abraham's, Abraham's bosoms or Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell, the Greek word there is Sheol, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on us. Send Lazarus to dip the finger to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember in your lifetime you received your good things when Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And beside all this, between us and you is a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over from there to us he replied then i beg you father send lazarus to my father's house for i have five brothers let him warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment abraham replied they have moses and the prophets let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Then he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. I find this story that Jesus told is one of the most interesting stories. It connects to me on so many levels. It doesn't come off just as a parable, like something that's gonna give a teaching. It comes off as sort of a structure, a clue into the nature of spiritual things. Here you have the rich man and here you have Lazarus. And the rich man who did not serve God dies and goes to Sheol. Then you have Lazarus, a beggar, who had a faith and heart for God. He dies and he goes to Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side. And then the story goes on that the rich man pleads with Abraham, send Lazarus just to comfort me. But Abraham says, no, there's a chasm between us. Then he says, send them to my brothers that they might hear and not come to this place of torment. And Abraham says, no, if they won't listen to the word of God while they are living, they're not going to come and listen to someone even who would rise from the dead. In that moment, you see the spiritual condition. And I still relate how some people hear the truth of Scripture and earnestly seek God, while others, you can try to convince them left and right about God, and they still won't listen. But in this passage, too, we see Sheol, not Gehenna, in description of hell as if there are two compartments for those who die yet before the resurrection of Jesus Christ someday. There's the Abraham's bosom or heaven, place where spirits go that have died, the spirits who have faith in God. And then there is the place of torment where spirits go who want to do it their own way, who don't want to be part of God. And, and again, it's, it's, I don't want to get too much exegesis and, and we don't have all the answers to this, but that Jesus would share this. We are introduced to the grave, Sheol. Old English would have called it hell. 
So, where did Jesus go? Well, I opt for Sheol, not Gehenna. Jesus suffers hell on the cross. He's not going to suffer hell again between Good Friday and Easter. We read in Mark 15, verse 34 and 35, At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sebastiani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where did Jesus go when he experienced the condemnation of God? I believe that was the hell of all hell. To be separated from God the Father. The punishment of all humanity and sin. That punishment is placed on Jesus Christ. A hell greater than any hell. Where did Jesus go between Good Friday and Easter? I opt for Sheol, not Gehenna, because I see that Jesus welcomes one criminal to paradise. Look at this passage, Luke 23, 39 through 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. This moment on the cross where the two criminals chime in to me is one of the most powerful examples of the cosmic reality of what Jesus was doing on the cross. It was the saving work and there are two criminals beside him. How, how ironic. These two criminals lived as criminals, but in that moment when they were facing their own death, one of them is still looking for an angle. Hey, I've got nine lives. Maybe there's something to this, Jesus. Hey, Jesus, if you're so powerful, Save yourself and us with you. This one criminal still is thinking about the angle. He is still looking for the option. The other criminal realizes there are no excuses. An innocent man is being killed and crucified. I, I deserve my punishment. And in that moment of faith, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This wasn't just something storied later on through trying to put theological significance to the cross of Jesus Christ. This was reconciliation in the moment and that one criminal was looking to God, to Jesus. Powerful, powerful moment. So let's look at some takeaways. As we've looked at these various scriptural passages, where was Jesus between Good Friday and Easter, and why does that matter? Well, the first takeaway is Jesus saves criminals like you and me. Romans 10 verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that Jesus raised him from the dead, you, you will be saved. 
I put this as the first takeaway because in all the discussion, it's not just about where was Jesus between Good Friday and Easter. It was that moment cannot be forgotten that as criminals, what matters is that we have been saved. That we bow our hearts to the God of the universe and receive his son, the sacrifice of the cross of Jesus Christ, his blood shed for us. That's what matters. We can do it ourselves. We can try to find an angle or we can lay down our life to Jesus Christ like the thief, like the criminal on the cross. We as criminals, we have all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, it says in Romans 3. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely through his grace. So the first takeaway is run to the cross and say to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me now as you are in your kingdom, as you have paid the price. You are my savior. I believe in you. I lay down my heart and I bow before you. Renew me, save me, change me. I bow to you, my king. The second takeaway is that Jesus' spirit was with the Father when it was finished. John chapter 19 verse 30 says, when he had received the drink, and that was, he was, he said, I was thirsty, he was, he was on the cross, he received the drink, it, darkness had spread over the land, Jesus says, it is finished. With that he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. When Jesus died on the cross and paid the penalty of hell for us, he was at that moment of death, his spirit. He gave up his spirit to his Father. At that point, waiting the resurrection, Jesus and his Father, their work was done for you and for me. W waiting for Easter, Jesus is now with his Father. The work was finished. Waiting the glorified body on Easter morning. For us, death is still not defeated. Know that. That there's something more to be done, and that's what Easter is all about. But Jesus gave up his spirit to his Father. When we die, we give up our spirit to our Heavenly Father. The payment of sin has been completed. We now go to paradise, to heaven. The Apostle Paul called the third heaven. We are with God. Jesus was now with his Father. Takeaway number three. Jesus may have been preaching to the spirits in prison in Sheol. 1 Peter 3, 18 and 20 says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom... He also went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Now, I've, I just want to, first of all, indicate that, you know, I've read a lot about this. This was actually one of the um, topics for my seminary dissertation way back in the 1980s and looked at, what does that mean? He, he was preaching to spirits in prison. What does that mean? What implications? Do you mean that some people who did not have the revelation of Jesus Christ, who never heard the gospel, were preached to, that their spirits were preached to, so that they are without excuse? 
Um, what does that mean about people today who have never heard the gospel? Um, are they lost? And, and I've reflected upon this, and I, there are other passages in the Bible that, um, it, like the Jonah passage is so interesting, how God cares about the city of Nineveh um, and sends Jonah to preach. Is God fully just? Is the blood of Jesus, does it cover all people? I and mean, there's all the debates about being universalist and not being universalist about salvation. Here's what I believe I have come to, is that, that the blood of Jesus cleanses people. And if you hear the gospel, know that the gospel is your only hope. What about those who have never heard the gospel? I believe that somehow the blood of Jesus is offered to them. Now, am I trying to create a school of theology about this? I am not. I just know that if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe that he rose um, from the dead, you will be saved. And I believe that it is possible that the grace of God preached by Jesus that everyone somehow who died, who never knew about Jesus Christ would be confronted with the truth. Are you with God? Are you with his plan? Or are you not with his plan? Now, having said all that, I believe that preaching the gospel right now is our passionate pursuit. I, I said I believe this through my study, but I don't know this. I'm what we are calling here theologizing a little bit about this. My unclarity theologically on this is great enough for me to be prompted to preach the gospel, to be passionate about this, that there is a Gehenna hell, that people need to hear the gospel. And while I see there are openings and as ministers, we can't be so clear about knowing who Jesus will have mercy to and who he will not if someone dies who never heard, or um, are all those who never heard damned j just because they were born at the wrong place in the wrong time? I mean, all of that stuff, I don't know the answer to, but I know that it says in the word, he preached to spirits in prison. I know that where he may have been between Good Friday and Easter was busy at work proclaiming to those who never knew Spirits who never knew, would those spirits look Jesus in the eye and like the criminal on the cross who confesses, would he, they say to him, I own you as my savior. Remember me in paradise. Or would they, like C.S. Lewis talks about, that those who are far away from God go farther and farther away from God. Now, my experience as a preacher and pastor and um, one who is raising up ministers and revival leaders knows this, that it, I cannot determine, I don't understand how people who are the thief on the cross on the one side versus the thief on the cross on the other side. But I know that Jesus saves. And our goal as ministers is to proclaim the gospel of salvation. And that really brings me to the fourth takeaway. Share the saving work of Jesus Christ to more criminals like you and me. Let's not theologize our way from the material point. 2 Corinthians 4, 7-19. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We carry, we always carry, 
around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. What I see from that passage is, in a sense, we carry around the death of Jesus. We identify with Good Friday, with what Jesus did. And then all around us are criminals on one side or the other side of us. We, we carry around this cosmic truth. And when people talk to us and look at us as we are ministering to others, one, we hear we are the smell of death, and the other, we are the fragrance of life. One criminal on one side sees us and, and we are an offense to them. And the other criminal says, look, I too need a savior. So the question, where, is, where was Jesus between Good Friday and Easter? Well, I believe he was with the Lord and um, I additionally believe that he was at work in people who never heard about the gospel. Again, we can theologize, the, theologize about what that means for today, and I don't have all the answers um, on either side of that coin, but I know that only those who profess that Jesus is Lord and Savior will come closer and closer to God forever. And those who reject um, have no part of God, and they go their own way. So, resurrection morning is coming. So Jesus not only stays in a spiritual state, but he rises from the dead. Then, where is he then? He is now elevated, Philippians chapter 2, to the right hand of God, given a resurrected body. A body that we will share with Christ Jesus, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. If the dead are not raised, our faith is futile. We, someday too, will have a resurrected body. For those who have died in the Lord, they are with the Lord in heaven. Our spirits are with the Lord. But someday, Easter will penetrate all reality. There is even more. And Easter morning, where will we be when Christ Jesus comes back? We will already be with God, with Christ, in paradise, third heaven, heaven. But someday there's even more. So we preach the gospel in season, not a season. We proclaim the good news that Jesus is Lord. He's our Savior. While we don't have all our questions answered, we know that we have our hope. And that hope is in our Lord Jesus Christ, who died to save us from our sins, who rose again from the dead, and who is with us both today and 